You guys hear me? You guys hear me in the fourth row? They said talk like I'm talking the fourth row. You all good? All right. That too. All right, guys. Well, I am, I'm Taylor Wyndham. Uh, I hope. Yes, sir. Thank you. Very kind. Uh, I, a uh, new student pastor here, uh, really for you guys who are here, I see some of your parents had a great time tonight with your students, I really enjoyed our discussions, fellowshipping, uh, and getting to know each other, that was fantastic, thank you parents who helped us, uh, my wife, Jordan, plenty of other people who helped us, thank you guys, tonight it went great, couldn't have done it without y'all, thank you, thank you guys for that. Uh, let's go ahead and read our scripture for tonight. If you would, go ahead and turn to Romans 1, 16 and 17. We're going to read that and then we're going to have our opening prayer. All right. Should have said this a second ago. You're probably going to want to take notes tonight. Uh, I, I, I say a lot of things. I talk very fast sometimes. Probably going to want to try to keep up. I encourage you to take notes on your phone or on paper, however you feel comfortable doing that. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For the gospel, for in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. I know it's a little different than what you see up there. So once you're there and you're at that spot, if you would, go ahead and bow with me. Let's pray. Father, I come tonight and I beg you. And I plead earnestly with you that you would open our eyes and that you would open our ears, that we may hear your word afresh and that we may hear your gospel afresh and that we may understand it and see it maybe in ways that we never have. Lord, I pray that you remove me out of the way, that you open my mouth and you speak through me, Holy Spirit, that these people would understand your word and that they would be enlightened and that they would be emboldened to believe and preach the gospel not only to others but to themselves. Lord, I pray that tonight they leave encouraged and that you blow into their soul the hope that only comes from Christ Jesus and his atoning, satisfactory work. Lord, I pray that you would give us greater revelation of what he's done. I pray that we would leave this place fired up. Lord, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so let's start this way going to ask you guys a couple of questions. First one's going to be this. If you are a Protestant here tonight, do you know what you're protesting? How many of you guys, by show of hands, would say you're a Protestant tonight? Any protesters in the house? Oh, okay, not many. Okay, so can somebody tell me, we're going to treat this like class, can somebody tell me what a protester is or what a Protestant is? What does that mean? What are you protesting? Amen. Amen. It's not just Roman Catholic. It's works-based salvation. I've got a long list here. We'll get to those. I want you to think about that question. If you're a Protestant here tonight, if you're a Protestant, if you're an evangelical, normally those go hand in hand, hopefully they do, then you are protesting false and oppressive systems of false gospels. That you are protesting systems that enslave men and women to works-based salvation in every way, shape, and form. And I hope that tonight you see better than maybe you did when you came into this room what those look like, how to avoid them, how to live and preach against them. That's one of my goals. One of my goals is to challenge you to see and fight at all costs for the true gospel of Scripture. That's one of my goals. One of my goals tonight, if you leave encouraged and fired up, saying, I protest, like Tim said a second ago, I protest every system that distorts, perverts the gospel of Christ. I stand against it with everything that I have within me. Then I will have done my job. So here's the second question. And you can answer if you'd like. What is the most important question that any person can ever ask themselves? What is the most important question any person can ever ask themselves. Now, am I going to heaven? Right up there at the very top. Anybody got any others? Okay, there you go. Any others? Exactly. 
All these are fantastic questions. Anybody else? Well, I can test at the question that maybe the most important, most impactful question a person can ask themselves is this. What can a sinful, unrighteous, wretched, vile human being do to be counted righteous in the sight of a holy and perfect God? The answer is nothing. Just spoiler alert. Absolutely nothing. But Christ has done it all. Amen? Amen. So tonight we want to look at that and we want to go over uh, a couple of dangers. One is that for you, you hear this presentation and you assume that you know it all and that you've heard it all and that you are complacent in what has been said and that you understand the gospel and you have a grip on what that means. And the danger is that you are lulled to sleep by your comfort and your familiarity. That is a danger. One of the other dangers tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is that I treat this in a trite and trivial manner because I assume that you know. So I don't mean to, to insult anybody's intelligence, but uh, I do teach eighth graders. <laughs> so, I'm saying, be discerning, be diligent, be focused, all right? The famous quote, one of my favorites, if you can spend any time talking to me and you know anything about me, you know I love Martin Luther. And one of my favorite quotes by him was that I preached the gospel to my congregation, Tim, you referenced this not long ago, preached the gospel to my congregation every week because every week they forget it. I might assert that every day you forget it as well, that I forget it as well. Do not make the mistake tonight of assuming that you know the basics and that you understand this and you don't need to listen to what God has to say just because you're familiar with it. Do not be lulled to sleep. It's one of Satan's favorite tactics. To lull people to sleep to the gospel. Now, if you would, we've read Romans 1, 16 and 17. If you would, and you want to flip and you've got a paper Bible like myself, let's go over to Galatians 1, and let's read all the way. We'll just go ahead and read down to verse 9. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead and all the brothers with him, to the churches in Galatia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, to rescue us from this evil age. According to the will of God the Father, to whom glory be forever and ever. Amen. This is verse 6. It's emphasis here. I am astonished, astonished, that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Pay attention. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one that we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned, anathema, damned. As we have already said, and so now I say again, if anybody's preaching to you a gospel other than what you have accepted, let him be eternally damned. Condemned, anathema is the Greek word. Now, there are three parts of this verse, these two verses he's got on the screen tonight, Romans 1, 16, and 17, that I want to look at. The first one I want to focus on is ashamed. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. I would guess, and this may be a kind guess, I would guess that maybe 5% of ministers, maybe, throughout all the churches in America, preach the true gospel of Scripture with an unashamed, unabashed manner. They are ashamed, and you know that because they add to or they take away from the gospel. They, I'll say that again. They add to or take away from the gospel. Addition or substitution is perversion. Addition or substitution is blasphemy. It's very serious. 
the very serious topic tonight that we're talking about. Notice Paul says there in verse 8 and 9, but even if we are an angel from heaven, preach to you another gospel other than the one that you received, let him be eternally damned, condemned, anathema. So there's, if you're taking notes, you might want to add this. There are two, two dangers, and I kind of said them a second ago, adding to the gospel, worth writing down, adding to the gospel or taking away from the gospel. So the question is, what is the big hubbub about? If the gospel is the way that men and women are saved, it's the way that they are reconciled to God, if they are righteous Filthy, wretched, unrepentant sinners. And the question I asked earlier is, how is it that a righteous or an unrighteous, unholy, filthy sinner can be reconciled to God, a holy, perfect, and righteous God? The question then becomes, if this message is the only way, then we can't afford to pervert it. We cannot afford to pervert it. There is no plan B. There's no plan C. There's no other option by which men must be saved other than the message of Christ, his perfect and finished work. Yes? I hope you believe that. It's worth fighting and dying for. We had a reformation 500 years ago, in case you're not aware, where we spent blood, sweat, and tears and rendered the Christendom, let's use that term, in two over this exact issue. And I think it's high time we maybe have another one. Because this issue is worth dying, living, fighting, being ostracized from our family, our loved ones, the people in our community, the people in Christendom. It is worth being separated from. Paul says right here, if you preach a different one, let you be eternally condemned. Twice. Even if an angel, he throws that in there to up the ante. Even if an angel preaches this, let him be, another gospel, let him be eternally condemned. Three reasons. There are many more. I'll give you three why I think we're ashamed. And I say we as a collective whole, hopefully you're not amongst this number. The gospel is simple and simply exclusive. The exclusivity of Christ, the message that we preach We preach Christ and him crucify. That message is exclusive. That message is not inclusive. No matter how the Pope and some of his recent gesticulations about different topics, no matter how he's intended to win over people, the gospel will always do one of two things. It will harden hearts or they will soften them. Preaching of it always does that. Maybe having it in here very, very important that we understand it's simply exclusive and it's also very simple. It doesn't need you to add to it, ladies and gentlemen. God's message is perfect. Absolutely perfect. Very interesting how you see in Galatians, it's not so much that they preached a different gospel. It's not so much that they didn't preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, his perfect priesthood, his perfect life, his ministry, and on and on, all of the facets of the gospel. It's not that they didn't preach that. It's that they wanted to add to or take away from it. And in doing so, distorted and perverted it. So, first reason is it's simple and it's simply exclusive. Second reason, can't be added to or taken away. And that's Galatians 1, 8, 9, if you want to use that reference. Here's the kicker right here, number three. Gospel gives man no glory, all to Christ. False religious systems always seek to elevate man. They always seek to put him on a pedestal so that he feels he is closer or more uh, within the reach of attaining perfection or attaining acceptance to God. Every one of them always. Every satanic false system that's ever existed is always about making man better, making man more like God. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. Every single one of them always has been. The gospel gives no glory to man. 
it gives all glory to Christ. The one who finished, began, completed, and has carried out. He who began a good work and you will see it to completion the day of Christ Jesus. Every single one. Every single day. It's him, not you. Right? I always tell people, any good that you see in me is him, and any bad you see is me. And you can ask my wife, that's definitely true. (laughs) So I have a list of things I rattled off here, if you want to take note of this, that I, I think are interesting and might help clarify. Sometimes in science class, we define things not just by what they are, but sometimes what they're not. It allows you to figure out what it is that it is. It helps you get at the root and the core of something, right? So I've got a list of things that I'll tell you the gospel is not, and I'm just going to give the disclaimer. Some of you might not exactly like this list. Talk to me afterwards. (laughs) Gospel is not religion. And by that, I mean it's not a set of systematic values, norms, works, deeds, and creeds. It's not a system of religion. I say that because most, I don't want to say most, many of Christian churches, and I use that term loosely today, uh, have traded in some set of religious norms for the gospel. That has become what is forefront to them. That's what they push. That's what they peddle, is a set of systematic views, values, norms. Gospel is none of those things. We are ashamed of it because we can't put it in our little religious box. Don't like that. We can't contain the gospel. We can't contain God. We don't like that. Number two, moralism. The gospel is not moralism. It is not behavioral modification and good intentions. I'll say that again. It is not behavioral modification and good intentions. It has nothing to do with you and your intentions It has everything to do with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and how you are able to live the life of Christ by his power through you to others. It has everything to do with an organic change in the heart that works its way to the will and the emotions. It has everything to do with a change that is internal, that is real, that is organic, that grows like grass not like a machine that requires oil. It's not mechanical. It's organic. It's not moral. It's not gritting your teeth and trying harder. It's not pulling yourself up by your moral bootstraps. That is the opposite. Thank God. Thank God it's not. Every other religion is. Every other system, every other false Christian version of the gospel ultimately boils down to those two things. Moralism and religion. Always. They always deteriorate to that lowest common denominator. Always. It's not prosperity. It's not health, wealth, name it and claim it. That is not the gospel. Now, if you believe that, we can talk afterwards. But the prosperity gospel, is no gospel at all. Because it has nothing to do with Christ and his atoning work. His finished, completed It is finished work. Because Christ and what he's done offers you far more than you could ask or think. It's not money. It's not cars. It's not prosperity. I'm not saying God doesn't want you to have good things. I'm not saying God doesn't want to be kind to you. And common grace doesn't fall on the just and the unjust. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that the gospel is not prosperity. It is not God has a wonderful plan for your life. That's not the gospel message. It's not Jeremiah 29, 11. The gospel message is Christ. And Christ alone. Make sense so far? It's not self-help, ladies and gentlemen. It is not think better, be better. I wrote in here the secret. It's not the secret. It is not about a mental status of you naming and claiming, and I know this goes back into the prosperity gospel, but it is not self-help. It is not about you thinking better and attracting positive things to your life. 
If that is the gospel message you preach to people when they ask, what is Christianity about? You're preaching a false gospel. You are robbing that individual of the only hope that they have, which is in Christ. You're going to get tired of me saying this. In Christ alone. Good. It's not signs and wonders. It is not supernatural manifestation of our faith and hope. It is not all of the things that we see, even though those may be real and those may be true, where God performs miracles on his own or through his body. It is not that. Those are trinkets. Those are byproducts. It is Christ and Christ alone. The finished work of Christ. I hope at some point in this message your heart sings with gladness. That at some point, I just say it enough, and the Holy Spirit uses it enough, that you sing and rejoice in your soul that Christ is sufficient. Church, I hope that for all of us. I hope that sincerely. It is not therapeutic. It is not counseling. Stemming from positive self-talk and process-based psychology. Say that a different way. It is not you going to a Christian counselor, even though those have their place, of course. It is not you talking to yourself, kind of like we talked about earlier with religion and self-help. It is Christ and the truth of the gospel that is objective and outside of yourself. See, I'm convinced, in case you haven't figured this out yet, that one of the things that we need most badly in Christianity today is to simply believe the truth of Scripture about the gospel. I am convinced, if you think I'm wrong, tell me. I am convinced that this is the balm that will heal many of the church's woes. Believing what is true about you because you believe what has been done by Christ. Amen? It's not the American dream. It's not two and a half kids. It's not a nuclear family. It's not a white picket fence. It's not $100,000, $150,000 a year. In fact, you could argue it sometimes might be the opposite. You ever heard of missionaries? Might be a good place to start. Lastly, it's not social. This one's important for our culture. It's not a social gospel. That's trash. It is not the good news about racial equality being gained at some point in the future. It is not about the good news of how a government can help work social plans and institutions to help people. That good news damns all and saves none. If that is what you call the gospel, open up scripture, repent, and believe. It is not social programs, societal, and cultural change. It's just not. So far, so good. Am I making sense? Y'all going to toss me out of here. (laughs) All right. So. Number two, if you're making kind of an outline here or you're writing notes, we're going to focus on the power of God next. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God to save. Greek word is dunamis, dynamite. Two things in the New Testament called the power of God, Christ and the gospel. Say that again. Two things, Christ and the gospel. Let me say something I don't know if you've heard. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. When it says that it is the power of God to save in Romans 1.16, it's saying that the message contains within itself the power of God to save sinners. Think about that. Think about what I just said. And then, of course, the follow-up question is going to be, what is it in churches that we have substituted, or in our lives, ministering to people, that we have substituted, ladies and gentlemen, because we think it is the power of God, 
methods, programs, a new Bible study, a, the list goes on and on, a new book that we got from Lifeway. On and on and on and on it goes. You can fill in the blank for yourself. My question to you, ladies and gentlemen, for your Christian life, not just for your salvation, but for your Christian life and what you are relying on at this very moment, what is it that you are telling yourself is the power of God, not only to have saved you, but to continue to save you? That sanctification, of course, was preceded by justification. We'll get to that in a little bit. Justified, made righteous in the sight of God. Saved, being saved. And notice it says it's the power of God to save, not saved. It's not previous past tense. So when it says it's the power of God to save, that is current tense. That means you are being saved by the same power that you were saved by. The power of God in the gospel of Christ alone. Faith alone, and we'll get to that as well. Come see my tattoo later. Okay. <laughs> so, a couple of thoughts here. Talk about the power of God. I've, I've been a part of churches. I'm sure you've been a part of churches. Hopefully you haven't in the past. Where we want to substitute something as the power of God. Something to be catchy. Something to be, add some flair. Something that we think is uh, a way to catch and bring in fish. Let's use that term, right? Chumming. Chumming the waters. <coughs> Chumming the waters, exactly. So you might want to write this down. I'll tell me how bad I am on time here. Got plenty more to go. The gospel alone, gospel alone has the power to expel and free the saint from the love of the world. Let me put that a different way. The power of God, in Romans 1.16, the message of the gospel, alone has the power to free you from the love of this world. If you are struggling with sin, ladies and gentlemen, if you are struggling with something you can't loose your grip on, chances are the gospel and preaching and believing and pleading and praying to God so that you can believe and see and savor Christ as all-sufficient will free you from that. Ten times out of ten. It's not about how great your faith is. It's about the object of your faith. The question, ladies and gentlemen, is what do you at this moment trust in? What is the power of God in your mind should examine that. We all should. The power of the gospel alone has the power to destroy guilt, shame, and ostracism. We'll say it again. Those who have been forgiven much love much. I'm going to say it for the people in the back. The gospel alone. Christ alone. And that's just shorthand for him. Alone has the power to free you from the guilt, shame, and ostracism of this world that other people put on you, that you tell yourself the lies you tell yourself at night, when you're alone with your own thoughts, whatever it may be, your guilty conscience, on and on and on it goes. Gospel alone has the power to free you from those things. Because you cannot forgive yourself, and even if you do, it doesn't matter. He's already forgiven you. What he has done is sufficient. You don't need to look to a confessor. You don't need to look to a priest. You don't need to, let me start it. You don't need to look to someone else to forgive you of secondary transgressions when you have been forgiven of all of your sins, all of your sins by the judge already. Probably worth pointing out at this point. John 8, 1 through 11, that passage of the woman caught in adultery. It's illustrative, I think, at this point to point out that Jesus says, He who is without sin casts the first stone. We all know that. We all quote it. Nobody casts a stone at him or at her, excuse me. 
And he said, has no one condemned you, woman? And she says, no one, Lord. And he says, and pay attention to the order, then neither do I condemn you, forgiven. Go and sin no more. Every single false religious system says the opposite. Go and sin no more, and God will forgive you. I forgive you. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Your forgiveness constitutes your obedience. Your obedience does not engender forgiveness. Say that to yourself a thousand times till you believe it. Over and over and over again. We're making sense. Gospel alone has the power to enable a heart to see and savor Christ as all-sufficient and all-satisfying. It is through this keyhole, as it is widened, that you are able to behold greater and greater amounts of the glory and perfection and perfect work of Jesus Christ, and he becomes to you more irresistible as you ponder and believe and read and fellowship and pray that God would open your eyes to see this so that the sins and the things of this world grow strangely dim. That alone will free you. Stop looking at other things. It's not going to work. They never have worked. So, let's, uh, let's write a couple of things up here on the board. Y'all thought, oh, we can get by without writing. No, we're not. I want to add this. Gospel power comes from believing what you are, seeing what he has done, and preaching the work of Christ to yourself. All right, so talk about a Latin term here. You might want to write this down. A lot of people were ticked off about this. All right. Simul. Eustus et peccator. Anybody know what that means? Tim, you don't count. You're talking anyway. You don't count. I said you don't count. Latin phrase, simultaneously just and sinner. Simul Eustus et peccator. Now, I bring that up. Because you should glory in that Latin term. You should glory in the fact that you still sin and yet you are accepted. And your position changes not one bit. Again, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Not the other way around. Every religious system, keep saying this over and over, will always say, go and sin no more. You'll be forgiven. Everybody in this audience, if you are legitimately born again and justified in the sight of God by the power of the Holy Spirit, that's true about you. Praise God. Praise God. And you can revel not only in the fact that you have been redeemed, but you can revel and you can glory in the fact that my behavior doesn't matter. It, I'm not saying go and continue sin. I'm not saying Romans 6. I'm not saying that. So don't, don't misunderstand me. What I'm saying is my behavior doesn't factor into the equation. Praise God. Tim said it the other day. All our good deeds are as filthy rags. But the question I have for you is, yes, that's inappropriate to mention in polite company. That, that term and what it means. The question I have for you is, do you believe that about yourself? Christian, do you believe that now about yourself? It's still true. The soul that sins shall surely die, says the Old Testament. There is no one righteous in Romans 3, no, not one. We have all together become worthless. There is no one who seeks God. On and on it goes. And a leopard changes spots, an Ethiopian changes skin color, on and on it goes. It's only good news, ladies and gentlemen, if you understand the bad news. 
It's only good news that you preach to yourself if you understand, hey, I'm no better in and of myself than I was the day I was redeemed. It's all of him. All of him. Don't steal his credit. Y'all are going to be like, what's wrong with this guy? So <clears throat> I, uh, there's a lot wrong with me. So I, <laughs> I, uh, one of my favorite movies is The Lion King. And uh, the other day I was watching it, and uh, I believe it was at school. Shouldn't be watching it at school. Sorry, sorry. So we were watching it for um, biology purposes, and we were trying to get ready for food webs and chains and stuff. And um, there's a scene that became very interesting to me. I believe the Holy Spirit opened my eyes to see this. So Simba, he's been out Hakuna matata out in the wild, right? If you ever watched The Lion King with Timon and Pumbaa, and he's been out there living his best life. Osteen. And uh, <clears throat> he's living his best life out there, and uh, he comes across old Rafiki, right? And he, at this crisis moment before he goes back, he, he's talking to Rafiki, and he says, uh, you knew my father? And Rafiki says, correction, I know your father, right? And he said, I hate to tell you, but he's dead. He died a long time ago. And he says, let me show you. He brings him over to a pond. He has him stare in the water. Simba staring in the water, right? And he says, do you see him? And he said, no. And he says this phrase, look harder. Right? Look harder. And he looks harder and he sees Mufasa. And Mufasa's words to him three or four times was, remember who you are. I don't think I need to explain to you why I reference that, but I will anyway. Your job, Christian, is to remember who you are. And it takes looking harder. Because your carnality, your flesh, will not allow you to believe those things of your own accord. They will not be something that you believe automatically and initially. It's not going to be something that you just wake up and say, you know what, I'm uh, more than a conqueror. I'm a co-heir. I'm adopted. I'm justified. I'm born again. I'm sanctified. I'm going to be glorified. Nothing can stop that. He who began a good work in me will see it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. None of that can be stopped. The God is for me and who can be against me? Heights, nor depth, nor angels, nor demons, or anything else, anything else in all of creation. None of that. You're not going to wake up believing that. It's not osmosis. You wake up every day and you preach that truth to yourself until your heart sings with gladness. Say it until you believe it. It's not a mantra. It's true about you because it's true about Christ and you are in Christ. Amen. Amen. So, I guess, uh, last thing. The righteousness of God, Romans 1.17, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith or from first to last. So <clears throat> going back to the board, you may want to write these down as well. Very important. So I'm going to write justificare, this is a Latin term for you Greek people. We're going to get to another one here in a second. Anybody know what that word means? It means that you're considered righteous when you act righteous. That's what the Roman Catholic Church taught forever, and they still teach. That's what every false religious system, as we referenced earlier, teaches. The idea that God reckons or counts someone righteous when they behave that way. I consider a child to have good behavior. If they show me they have good behavior. We judge and base everybody based upon what they do. Always. We trust people because of how they act, or we don't trust people because of how they act. We're friendly to people because maybe they were friendly to us, but it's always based upon their actions. It's always based upon their words and their deeds. Yes? I'm not going to write it down, but the Greek word, by the way, the original word, not used to ficare. Trash doesn't belong in the Bible. 
It's dikaiosune. That word, ladies and gentlemen, I hope becomes one of your favorite words because it's when God reckons or counts righteousness to someone who is not inherently righteous in and of themselves. Imputation. God reckoning a sinner righteous. How scandalous is that? Think about that. Dikaiosune. Sure, sure. See if I can spell it. God considering a righteous, a, a, a vile, unrighteous, filthy, wretched sinner to be righteous because of the work of Christ. Imputed. That's what is true of you. If you are a Christian, that is true of you. You fall back on that always. It is, uh, Luther called it an alien righteousness. Strange way of putting it. We think of little green people in spaceships. What he was saying is it's foreign to you. It's a righteousness that is outside of the individual, that is given to you. We oftentimes think, and this is where we stop when we talk about the gospel presentation. We talk about imputed righteousness. We talk about forgiveness of sins, and all those things are 100% true. But we stop with the fact that we, we believe that we're like Adam, that we are a blank slate, that we have been forgiven, or some of us wrongly believe that all of our bad deeds have been forgiven in the past, and Christians, some of them teach, you have to continue on because from that point on, you've got to maintain your righteousness by the power of the Holy Spirit, and God's not forgiving future misdeeds. I don't believe that. He said it is finished. It's finished. It's real simple as far as I'm concerned. But we talk a lot about remission of sins. We talk a lot about forgiveness of sins, but we don't talk about enough this Romans 117 verse, the idea that dikaiosune, that you are imputed the righteousness of Christ and that God reckons, credits, or counts righteousness to you that is not inhering in your soul. We don't talk about the fact that you have the righteousness of Christ, the perfection, the perfect record of Christ. We talk a lot about his death, but we don't talk enough about his life. Without his perfect life, you might could be forgiven, but you're not going to be righteous. And, I don't, and I, I'm saying his submission to God under the law, remission of sins, and imputation of his righteousness, that you are given his righteousness. So it's not a matter of how you behave because it's not your righteousness to begin with. It's his. Uh, how many of you, if you're being honest, would say that very oftentimes you struggle with feeling like you don't know how God feels about you? Raise my hand. That you, for whatever reason, and there are many, but it boils down to the fact that you think he's judging you on the basis of your behavior. You think that he's looking at you through the lens of, of his perfect law and seeing if you stack up. That was you before Christ. Right? I mean, how many times do we get crossways with our loved ones, people we know love us the most, and we, for whatever reason, we think that that fluctuates or that wavers. And we do the same. We project that onto God. But thank God that that imputed righteousness, that dikaiosune, that righteousness given to you, the credited to your account, wasn't earned by you, and it won't be taken away by you. It should make you sing. It should make your heart sing. Because what it's saying, ladies and gentlemen, is the one person whose approval you most desperately need in the universe, you have. And nothing can change that. See, I think we oftentimes preach a shriveled, shrunken, gospel because we are afraid of how scandalous it sounds but it's the truth of scripture
We couldn't rightly talk about this topic without talking about faith alone. You know me, you know I talk about that a lot. One of the ways that Romans 1.17 can be translated, you know how it says from faith to faith, from first to last, is actually faith alone, interestingly enough. What it's saying is that that faith is from the beginning. The just shall live by faith from the beginning all the way through to the end. But guess what? That's faith alone. Not faith plus works. Not faith plus you trying harder. Not faith plus you going to the confessional booth. Not faith plus you doing any sort of self or physical or spiritual flagellation. It's not acts of penance. It's not freaking purgatory. Finished work of Christ. Nothing more serious than that. There's nothing more serious than believing that everything that he has is now yours. And everything that is rightly his as the ruler who's been given the keys of death and Hades, the one who overcame the grave, the eternal, perfect, righteous, holy son of God, that you're a co-heir and more than a conqueror with him. It's insulting to try to add your filthy works to that. Vile. I hope you see it that way. Making sense? I know I'm, I'm out of time. A couple of things I want to leave you with, and I'm done. I'm almost done, I promise. <laughs> Might want to write these down. I highlighted these on mine. <clears throat> the gospel life. I want to give you some characteristics. I told you what it wasn't earlier. I'm going to tell you what it is now, what it looks like. It looks like changing where you hide. Now, by that I mean a reference to Adam and Eve and how the first thing that they did when they sinned was their eyes were open, they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together to cover their nakedness. And ever since then, we've always been hiding in something. We've been hiding from God in our work, in our Christianity, Said that one probably. In our, Christ, in our Christianity, hiding from God in our moralism. There is such a thing, ladies and gentlemen, of someone believing they are so moral, older brother in Luke 15, that they don't need God. The way to outrun God, some people believe, is to be moral enough that you don't need him. It's the sick who need a savior, after all. Not the righteous, not the well. If you can convince yourself you're good enough, Hey, I don't need Jesus. That stuff's for sick people. You're the most sick of all. So changing where you hide, finally coming home to rest and hide in Jesus Christ. Not in a fig leaf or in a tree or in your work or your moralism or your behaviors, but in Christ and Christ alone. I said this earlier, it's identity remembrance. Gospel-oriented life. A life that's truly been changed by these truths we've hopefully understood tonight is about identity remembrance. It's about you remembering who you are. Mufasa, remember who you are. Gospel life looks like power abandonment. You stop striving to prove to yourself that you're good enough. You stop striving to prove to other people that you're worthy of their affection and their love. Because the person who you love and who loves you the most has given you every indication by dying and being resurrected in your place. So that the person that loves you the most, the judge of all the earth, the righteous one who sees every inclination of your wicked heart is the person who loves you the most. Not loves you the most, not ooey gooey, Efficaciously, effectively. The only one who could do anything about it. I can love you all I want. I can't save your soul. And neither will your work or your works. It's about power abandonment. It's about losing the idea to try to generate favor and merit with God. 
Lose it. Because in losing it, you find acceptance, you find understanding in who and what Christ has done. I've said this a thousand times. It's basically the same thing over and over. Preaching the gospel to yourself daily. Get up and remind yourself every morning what's been done for you. And it's amazing how it will change your outlook when you understand how much you've been forgiven, then in turn you forgive. When you understand how patient he has been with you, you are patient with others. When you understand how much he loves you, it becomes a little easier to love that person that you don't feel any love for. Remember, you were his enemy when he saved you and died for you. You have enemies. No excuse. No excuse. You can go on and on about that. Surrendering self-justification. Gospel life looks like surrendering self-justification. Stop trying to prove that you're good enough. You lay the weapons down and you say, I'm not good enough. Simul Eustace at peccator. I know I'm simultaneously just and a sinner. And I revel in the fact. I can wag my finger in the devil's face and say, even though I have sinned, even though my transgressions are many, what has happened on behalf of me by the eternal Son of God is good enough that none of what I do matters. You can't condemn me anymore. Romans 8.1, therefore there is no, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Believe it. Stop trying to justify yourself. You've already been justified. Self-proving goes with self-justification. And this last one, this could be a whole separate sermon, viewing God as his own reward. So the question that I should ask you now for you to ponder would be, what's the end and the means for the cause of your salvation? A better way to put that more clearly would be, why did he save you? Just so you could avoid hell? Just so you could worship in heaven or probably scream like I'll do up there and shout sermons of people? No. Every atom, every person, every angel, every star, everything in all of creation there to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And if you don't understand this, talk to me afterwards. God is his own reward. God is the reward of the gospel. The gospel alone can turn slaves into sons, stone hearts into flesh, duty into delight, rejects into heirs, Goats into sheep, enemies into friends, spiritually poor into spiritual conquerors, condemned sinners into blameless saints, the guilty into the forgiven, and can exalt Christ perfectly. And I'll end with this story. Most of you guys by this point know of who my son Hamill is, my whole world. He loves strawberries. He loves all fruit, but he loves strawberries. Now, if over time he starts to have strawberry milkshakes or strawberry preservatives or synthetic strawberry flavor, whether it be in gum or candy, he's going to grow accustomed to synthetic strawberry flavor. And if I try to give him strawberries, real, the real thing down the road, he's probably going to reject them in favor for the synthetic, the fake That's just like the gospel, ladies and gentlemen. If you find yourself here tonight, and if you know someone who has grown cold or fallen away, the only cure for loving the real taste of strawberries is to go to the patch and eat them again and again and again until you reacquire the taste. Come to the fountain of living water, everyday Christian, and drink deeply of Christ. That's all I got. Thank you, guys.